Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Elizabeth Corbett. A gruesome joke. What a detestable place to come to. Surely Aunt Belle must have taken it for no other reason than to spite us and make our lives miserable. But I neither can nor will endure existence in this dreary hole, and I give you my word for it. We shall have changed our habitation back within six months, or my name is not Jack Brereton. But how will you manage it? I am as little in love with the place as you are, but if Aunt Belle is bent upon remaining, she is not likely to let our fancies influence her actions. Besides, if we cannot make up our minds to live here, it is at our own option to migrate to a more civilized region without dragging Aunt Belle about. What do you think, Jim? What do I think? Why, I think as Jack does. It's a beastly shame for the old fool to expect three young fellows to live in an ancient hole like this, and... Like Jack again, I am determined to put an end to such folly as soon as possible. And put an end to your present good prospects at the same time? What an idiot you must think me. You are about the slowest cove I know, Bryce Brereton. But that is no more reason why you should credit other folks with possessing no more brains than yourself. This last was said in so sneering and contemptuous a tone that Bryce Brereton felt his passion rising, and in order not to encourage its boiling over, he abruptly left the room, his forbearance merely serving, however, to call forth another sneer at his cowardly tameness. The three youths were the sons of Miss Bell Brereton's two dead brothers. Jack and Jim were twins, their cousin Bryce's senior, by a few months only. A singular string of fatalities had resulted in the whole three becoming dependent upon their aunt at a very tender age. The late John Brereton had been a solicitor, and his brother Bryce had chosen the church as his profession. But neither of them had made much headway in the world when death first robbed them of their fairly young wives and then claimed each of them in turn as his victims. Thus it happened that had Miss Bell not had both the inclination and means to do well by them, the boys would have been thrown upon the world's charity. How Miss Bell Brereton had come by these means was a fruitful topic of wonder and comment among her limited circle of acquaintances. She had always been of a very retiring disposition, and had consequently not made so many friends as a showier young woman might have done. But those who were at once admitted to her confidence always learned to love and esteem her, and as she never had the faculty of making enemies, nothing but sympathy was expressed for her when her father died and left her nothing but a small annuity of thirty pounds a year that he had managed to scrape together for her out of the savings of his country practice. Of course, thirty pounds a year was much better than nothing, but it was not sufficient to support her, and she did the most natural thing under the circumstances, sold the furniture her father had left her, and accepted a post as a governess somewhere in the north. She was twenty-nine years of age, was thoroughly well educated, and was therefore quite capable of managing her own affairs and earning her livelihood. She had always lived in a humdrum little village, which was so far removed from every populous business center that as the young fellows grew up, they all migrated to the towns, and eventually found partners for life among young ladies who were more favorably placed than Belle Brereton, who, beautiful though she was, was reputed to never have had an offer in her life. For two years, little was heard of Miss Brereton and her native haunts. At the end of that time, she reappeared in Marlby, having heard of the death of her brothers and the almost destitute condition of her three young nephews. She looked pale, sorrowful, almost tragic, in fact, as if she had gone through some terrible experience. Her beauty had, however, increased rather than diminished, and there were many who gazed upon the graceful, dignified, sphinx-like woman with positive awe. Yes, she was sphinx-like. That was an undeniable fact. There was just ground for wondering what had produced the remarkable change in her, making her look, as romantic Ethel Middleton averred, like an extinct volcano, whose outward beauty has been but increased in consequence of the passions which have surged over and changed its commonplace exterior to one of calm and glorious majesty. There was also another ground for wonderment. Whence came all the money she now spent so lavishly? An annuity of thirty pounds per annum would not account for it, and as she had only been away from Marlby two years, she could not have saved it. Such a thing as a legacy in her favor had not been heard of by anyone hereabouts, and it was therefore not at all surprising that Miss Brereton should be the subject of endless comments and speculations, not all of them quite complimentary, either. 
but no one had a word to say against her with reference to her treatment of her orphaned nephews. She announced her determination to bring them up and fit them for whichever trade or profession they might eventually choose. By way of preliminary, she sent them all to a first-rate county school, where they remained until they were the ages of 17 and 16, respectively. She then, in response to their earnest solicitations, agreed to let them study at a university for a few years. They were wild with glee for a time, but this pleasure moderated considerably when they discovered that Oxford, the goal of their desires, was not their destination, and that sleepy little Durham had been fixed upon. Farewell to the dreams of rollicking and roistering, in which Jack and Jim, at least, had indulged, and goodbye to many a wild plan they had formed. It must be confessed that the idea of actual study had not entered much into their calculations. They had heard marvelous stories of the doings of certain wild young spendthrifts, whom they actually wished to emulate. If exorbitant prices are charged at Oxford, it is more than easy to get credit there. Indeed, the difficulty lies in the other direction. The Oxford student has to be provided with a certain amount of moral force and courage to enable him to steer clear of the numerous traps which are set in order to induce him to run up bills. So many of these bills are never paid at all that those who are honest have to pay enormous prices in order to balance the profit and loss of the Oxford tradesman's business to his liking. Said business is, upon the whole, more of a gambling affair than anything else, and, whether he be a cash customer or whether he be a credit customer, the result to the buyer is pernicious all the same. In the one case, his pocket suffers. In the other, his morals. Miss Brereton was evidently cognizant of all the evils likely to arise from sending young fellows to associate with those whose means or whose morals might prove an equal source of temptation, and she therefore chose the Northern University as less likely to spoil her boys, none of whom she has yet suspected of ingratitude, although she had noticed several other traits in the character of the twins which pained her. But if they were disappointed to find out that they were not to go to Oxford, how much worse was their chagrin to learn that they were not to be emancipated from domestic control during the term of their study, but that Aunt Belle herself intended to migrate northwards when they did. I have a house not far from Durham, she informed them. It is somewhat out of repair, but I can soon have it put right, and we will all live there until your studies are complete. They did not take the information kindly, as they anticipated a considerable curtailment of their freedom through their aunt's presence. But they were very much surprised to hear of this old house, for they were not aware that Miss Brereton had ever been in the county of Durham, and they had no idea that she had any possessions there. When they arrived at Flood Hall, their previous notions as to its probable appearance and discomforts were more than justified. It was a dismal, damp, dreary old place, to which the mildew of ages seemed to give an ogreish look calculated to frighten even the stout hearts of three mischievous lads. Perhaps its damp and preternaturally gloomy appearance was largely due to the trees amid which it was built, and which had now grown to such magnificent dimensions as completely to intercept the sun rays, which would otherwise have cheered and warmed the place a little. Even Miss Brereton felt chilled by the dismalness of her new abode until the curtains were drawn and the outer prospect shut out after nightfall. Then, with glorious fires burning in the huge grates, and numerous lamps lighted in the hall and in the other rooms, the building asserted itself as a fine old pile, which deserved more than the neglect it had met with of late years. And yet Miss Brereton had a curious habit from the first night of pushing aside the curtains of one of the drawing-room windows and peering through the leafy screen of foliage into the graveyard beyond. Not much of it was even then to be seen, but such prospect as was visible appeared to afford the lady some consolation inasmuch as she never seemed to tire of sitting and gazing in that direction. At such times her face would assume a sad, longing expression, and more than once the tears had been seen to chase each other down her cheeks. The servants whom she had engaged vowed that there was something uncanny both about the house and about its mistress, and not one of them would have ventured out alone after nightfall. Not that they believed in ghosts, oh no, only, as they invariably averred when questioned on the subject, it isn't very canny. If the servants found it eerie, the three boys found it intolerable, and Jack especially was bent upon terrifying his aunt out of the place if no other means were successful in persuading her to leave it. 
The Christmas vacation promised ample opportunity for carrying out their plans, but Bryce now protested that he would neither condone nor participate in foul play. When angrily questioned concerning his meaning in using these words, he said that by foul play he meant anything that could trouble his aunt in any shape or form, though he admitted that he liked the place no better than his cousins did and would welcome any legitimate means of inducing Miss Brereton to leave it. There were several angry scenes between the cousins, but ultimately the twins resolved to exclude Bryce from their confidence in future, as they did not feel quite able to trust him. It was astonishing after a while what a number of queer stories the lads had managed to rake up concerning former tenants of Flood Hall, and what a number of ghosts the place was credited with possessing. They were all remorselessly poured into Miss Brereton's ears, but she professed to place no credence upon them, though Bryce saw that she was pained, and urged his cousins to be more considerate, only to be called a fool for his pains. But there was one story that had a terrible effect upon their aunt. Do you know, said Jack, one evening, when the family had adjourned to the drawing room as usual, Harry Spence told me a queer tale today. He says that this house and the land round it belonged to the Merivales for generations, and that they only died out a few years ago. That would be about the time when you bought the place, I expect, aunt. There were two brothers left, and they both fell in love with the same lady, who had come to be governess of the child of the younger brother, whose wife was dead, or at least supposed to be. The governess preferred the widower, who was also the poorer of the two, but had hitherto always been pressed to share Bernard Merivale's home. Shortly before the marriage was to take place, little Maud Merivale died of congestion of the lungs, and her distracted father went so far as to say that her uncle Bernard had deliberately taken her, and kept her for more than an hour in a place so damp and ague-striking that everybody shunned it, in order that she might catch cold and die, and therefore enable her uncle to be avenged on her father for robbing him of his bride. After this there was a terrible quarrel. Bernard Merivale went away. Hubert and the governess got married, and lived here for a year, when something dreadful happened. Hubert Merivale was brought home one day shot through the side, none knew by whom, and he appeared like one dying. That same night, Mrs. Merivale's baby was born, but did not live till morning, and Mrs. Merivale herself had received such a terrible shock that people at first thought she too would die. But they both recovered their health again, and, soon after, Bernard Merivale came back, suffering from consumption. It is said that he swore that his brother's first wife, of whose death they had heard long ago, was not really dead, but that she, being a bad woman, who had left her husband for another man, had caused false tidings of her death to be sent to him for certain purposes of her own. This was terrible enough news, but when Bernard went on to say that he had seen the real Mrs. Mary Vale, Hubert's rage overpowered him, and he gave his brother the lie. Then ensued a frightful scene. Hubert flew at Bernard with the fury of a tiger, probably forgetting the state of health he was in at the time. The contest was short and unequal, Bernard fell to the ground, his heart's blood flowing from his mouth onto the dress of the unhappy wife, who had vainly tried to part the two. Then Hubert, still frenzied with passion, looked down to see his wife bending over the fallen and dying man and shrieking for aid in an agony of grief. At once he jumped to a fearful conclusion. She, too, is faithless. She, too, loves someone better than she loves me, he cried. The next moment he fell dead before her, shot by himself, this time through the heart. The unhappy brothers lie buried in one grave, and after the funeral, the unfortunate widow disappeared. It is supposed that she sold the estate, and that she is dead, as nothing has since been heard of her. But the brothers are often to be heard quarreling about the place, and they say that every 23rd of December, the anniversary of the final tragedy, the scene is reenacted here, and that the despairing wife's shrieks resound through the place. While Jack told his story, Jim and Bryce had listened with breathless eagerness, never noting its effect on Miss Brereton. Now they turned eagerly to her, and were startled to note that her head had fallen forward upon the arm of the couch on which she sat, her motionless attitude filling them with foreboding. With one accord they ran towards her, to find that she had fainted, and it was some time before the servants they hastily summoned were able to restore her to consciousness. She was ill for several days after this, but obstinately refused to see a doctor, 
though Bryce in particular urged her to do so. It is strange, he said to his cousins, that Aunt Belle should bury herself alive as she does. She positively sees no one. No wonder we are pestered by questions as to who our aunt really is. Only yesterday a fellow asked me if her right name wasn't Mary Vale, and whether she was the real or fictitious Mrs. Mary Vale. I could have knocked the fellow down, though I had not the slightest idea what he meant at the time. Since hearing your story last night, I think it is quite possible that she is no other than the poor lady who spent so tragic a time here. It would be natural on her part to be silent as to her past life, when doubts as to the legality of her marriage had once entered her mind, for we all know her to be a proud woman. But she has earned our love and gratitude, and I think it was a shame of you, Jack, to tell the story to her face, for you must have felt sure all the time that she was Mrs. Maryvale. Now, none of your preaching, was Jack's answer to this reproach. I told you that I thought I should get her out of the house, and I think very little more will manage it now. Good heavens, Jack, you surely do not mean to torment her again, after seeing what a terrible effect last night's experience had on her. So expostulated Bryce. But Jack saw no harm in pursuing his scheme to completion, although he carefully forbore to initiate his cousin into his future plans. Jim, however, entered into them heartily, and for a day or two there was a good deal of whispering going on between the two. On the twenty-third day of December, they admitted two friends of theirs into their own apartments, and so managed matters that nobody but themselves was cognizant of the new arrivals. Miss Brereton had not recovered her former calm, dignified condition. She appeared restless and anxious, and not all Bryce's well-meant attempts to amuse her sufficed to lift her from the gloom into which she had been thrown. It was the anniversary evening of the death of the brothers Mary Vale, and Bryce could see by the nervous clasping and unclasping of her hand, and by her restless movements, how uneasy she was. "'Auntie, dear,' he said at last, "'I'm afraid you have let Jack's absurd little story worry you far too much. Of course you do not believe that yarn about the annual apparition. Jack only mentioned it to frighten you out of this house, because it is so gloomy, but it was only a joke of his, and I wish you would try to think no more about it. My dear boy, was Miss Brereton's sad answer, I cannot dismiss this matter from my mind for many reasons, not the least of which is the fact that a boy to whom I have stood as a mother, and who owes everything to me, would deliberately wound me as Jack did the other night. He must have known all the time that I myself was the unfortunate woman whose story he was narrating, and he must have been aware that every word he uttered was the most cruel stab he could give me. So selfish a nature of his deserves punishment, and I have already taken the most effectual means of punishing him. My story was too sad to be put in the mouths of gossips, and I could not endure to be pitied, nor to be pointed out as a woman who had, however unwittingly, been tricked into a false marriage by the man who loved her hence my silence regarding my past. That both brothers loved me, I have never doubted, and the thought that but for my advent here, they might still both have been happy and well, has embittered my life more than my own sorrows. Both Hubert and Bernard had willed all their possessions to me, and the good uses to which I have been enabled to devote the wealth placed at my disposal has been some consolation to me. When I am gone, I hope you will use your share nobly and wisely." There is one thing you must not forget. Bury me beside the two men who loved me only too well. You can see the grave through that window. My dear aunt, do let us go away to some place that will be more cheerful. You are ill and overwrought. You... But what Bryce would have said was stayed by a wild, blood-curdling shriek, which resounded through the apartments. Then hurrying footsteps were heard approaching, and the twin brothers came running into the room, their fright being so evidently exaggerated that Bryce who had reason to fear some trick on their part, knew it to be assumed. Almost simultaneous with their entrance, other sounds were heard, as of two men quarreling. The sounds approached closer, and the facsimiles of two portraits Bryce had often noticed appeared on the scene, gesticulating violently. Then one of them exclaimed, in evident fury, It is true, she is alive, I have seen her. Whereupon the other figure sprang at him, a short struggle took place, and one fell to the floor, appearing to be bleeding from the mouth. Then the shriek, in imitation of a woman's voice, was repeated, and the other figure cried out, She, too, is faithless, fired a revolver in the air, 
and made a feint of falling lifeless onto the other body. Bryce would have rushed up and stopped the farce had he not been held back by the twins, who had no mind to have their joke spoiled. The whole thing was over quickly, and the masqueraders jumped up and made off when they heard servants running to see what was the matter. But if their farce was over, its consequences were not. There was a stifled gasp from Miss Brereton, and as Bryce hurriedly turned towards her, she fell forward. The twins were now also startled and sprang to her aid. Too late, however, for the poor lady was dead. Their joke had proved too gruesome. It was not thought that Miss Brereton really believed that what she saw was an apparition, but it was a cruel blow to feel that she had been made the subject of a ghastly hoax by her nephews, and it was thought that the excitement, added to her weak condition, had killed her. Jack Brereton, as well as Jim, had ample cause to rue their mischievous propensities, for in a new codicil, added to her will a few days before her sudden death, she left all her possessions to her nephew Bryce. He, however, preferred to settle as much on his cousins as sufficed to meet all their expenses and give them a fair start in the world. But he has never been able to make up his mind to live at Flood Hall, and left it shortly after seeing that his aunt was interred in the spot she had chosen as her final resting place. The two youths who assisted the twin brothers in their stupid and wicked joke were censured enough to make them resolve to eschew any such practices in the future. As for my own share in this drama, it is nil, but I have thought that it would prove quite as interesting as some of the reminiscences in which my firm bears a practical part, hence its place among these inquiry office secrets. Just lately I have heard a little news of Flood Hall. The whole district is undermined by coal workings, and subsidences are common in the district. Flood Hall and the cemetery have fallen in, and their site is now marked by a large pond, above the surface of which old trees still erect their hoary heads, and near whose black and slimy depths no one ventures that is at all superstitious. The End